Um, all right. Well, um, thanks a lot. Um, I will continue on this theme of uh, twisted bilayer graphene um, and uh, try to tell you a little bit about uh, correlations um, and their interplay with topology. Uh, Andre uh, mentioned some of this already, and uh, Pablo uh, also touched upon this. But uh, yeah, we're going to try to dive in a little bit more into this. Um, the plan is that in the first lecture, um, we'll try to cover some RG treatment. And in particular, um, how do we actually project onto the narrow bands? And we're going to find sort of a surprising result, um, namely that with Coulomb interactions, the system uh, flows towards the chiral limit. Um, I will introduce uh, exactly what this means um, and what are some of the consequences of that. We will not quite reach the chiral limit, but but we will we will approach it. Um, and then uh, for the rest of the um, first lecture, I'll try to say something about uh, the strong coupling uh, theory once we are entirely within the narrow bands. Um, and then in the second lecture, which will be tomorrow, I will discuss some results of the DMRG on uh, a model for the narrow bands um, in which we consider single valley and single spin. Uh, we're going to discover that there are some really interesting uh, many body phases, including a phase which does not break C2T symmetry, but doubles the unit cell. So it breaks translational symmetry. And remarkably, it's gapped. Um, and uh, the mechanism behind this, um, I will try to explain, <clears throat> is this non-abelian Dirac node braiding. Um, and then um, we'll try to discuss in the, in, the, in the second part of the second lecture, um, how to think about the single particle excitations uh, connected to the cascade transitions. Um, and um, then I will come back to the questions that have been asked before, namely, how do we think about 2D Vanier states in this topological narrow band? Um, and we'll find that it's actually a complementary uh, way of understanding the physics, um, which in some cases actually could be practical in that it allows us to understand the dependence on the screening. Um, uh, of various strong correlated uh, uh, phenomena, in particular, what happens to the gap and what happens to the effective mass of the excitation. So, so that's the plan. Maybe it's a bit too ambitious, but let's see how far we can get with this. And um, as usual, please feel free to uh, interrupt and uh, ask questions. Um, so I've been very fortunate to collaborate with Jian Kang, who was a postdoc at the MAGLAB. He's now on a faculty at Suzhou University in China. Uh, these are the papers uh, that uh, we co-authors based on which this um, set of lectures is, um, uh, is built. Um, and then in this last paper uh, on Cascade, we were very fortunate to also collaborate with Andre uh, Bernevik. So I don't need to introduce this too much, but uh, there will be an, a, 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 an intuition that I would like to give you uh, so you can keep in mind as we go along in this, um, in this, in this set of lectures. Um, so I will need to go back to uh, explaining uh, how to think about uh, the narrow bands. So, um, um, so imagine we have uh, two honeycomb layers uh, rotated relative uh, to each other by some small angle theta. Um, if the angle is small, we will see that there is a new uh, super period which um, is long compared to the microscopic carbon-carbon distance. Um, and this uh, new superpotential uh, will uh, scatter the Dirac, Dirac particles within uh, each of the monolayers, reconstruct uh, their spectrum, uh, and create a new set of bands. Um, and now, because uh, this period is so much larger, um, there's a fewer number of uh, electrons per uh, area that we need to add or subtract from these bands. Um, and so this now uh, is uh, perfectly uh, doable using a field effect uh, transistor type techniques um, uh, as opposed to doping, uh, which is what you would have to do if you wanted to change the uh, carry concentration in something like a cuprate. So this can now be done reversibly. Now, uh, if, we, um, if we consider just uh, 
two decoupled layers for a second, so ignore the interlayer tunneling, um, then, um, well, and they're relative, relative to each other by some twist angle theta, then let's say the bottom layer, which is uh, sketched by the blue, is going to have a large Brillouin zone, uh, which has the famous uh, Dirac, cones, uh, Dirac points uh, in the corners of this Brillouin zone. So here, one of them is marked by K1. Um, and then the other layer, which is rotated relative to it, um, is going to have a rotated Brillouin zone by the twist angle theta. And, uh, and therefore, its Dirac uh, uh, point is going to fall onto a different uh, momentum point. Uh, this is marked by K2. And so for now, theoretically, let's just assume that the two layers are decoupled. And let's think about what would happen to the dispersion as we uh, move along this line that joins K1 and K2. Well, there's going to be a Dirac point uh, at K1 that's sketched over here with blue. And there's going to be a Dirac point at K2 that's sketched with red. And in the absence of any tunneling between the two layers, there will be no level repulsion. These uh, lines would cross over here and over here. And the energy scale associated with that crossing, well, it's uh, uh, the slope, which is set by the Fermi velocity, and then um, uh, half the displacement in momentum space uh, between these two uh, uh, direct points. Um, now, um, so, so, that's, so, so that's the energy scale here. Delta K is now the separation uh, between them. But now if we turn on the interlayer tunneling, um, and as we will see, there are two different uh, kinds of interlayer tunneling that we need to consider. W0 uh, corresponds to the interlayer tunneling through the AA region and W1 through the AB region. Um, then there will be a level repulsion. These two uh, uh, levels will no longer cross. Um, and that's set by uh, this scale. And so now you can imagine that um, let's say holding the angle fixed so that the energy scale Vf delta k is fixed. So the energy scale associated with the crossing is fixed. And now you start increasing uh, the interlayer tunneling. These levels are gonna push against each other uh, more and more, they will repel more. And eventually you're gonna start flattening out uh, the band um, that's left over. Um, and so you can imagine that there is some uh, special uh, condition um, when the ratio between this uh, 2w0 or w1 divided by uh, vf delta k is of order uh, 1, um, um, in which case the um, in which case the, uh, the band could get very flat. Uh, so that's the basic intuition. Um, now, uh, let's see. So suddenly I lost control. Let's see. Here we go. Um, so the uh, the separation between the cones uh, and therefore the energy scale uh, associated with the crossing is controlled by this uh, twist angle theta, um, um, while the interlayer tunneling is controlled by um, uh, by in principle uh, an external pressure. Okay. Um, now, uh, here's a more uh, sophisticated uh, calculation based on the so-called continuum business of McDonald's model that, that we will come back to, uh, in which we're going to continuously uh, decrease the angle from uh, three degrees. Three degrees is uh, far away from the magic angle for twisted bilayer graphing. Um, and because we are decreasing uh, the angle, uh, we are increasing the period uh, of this new uh, superstructure in real space, and therefore we will be shrinking the Brillouin zone. But instead of uh, drawing this for uh, progressively smaller Brillouin zones, I'm just going to continuously rescale the size of the Brillouin zone so that the x axis in this little movie that is about to play will be uh, fixed. Um, and the cut uh, along which this is plotted is, is, is shown here. Okay? So um, now the interlayer tunneling in this particular case is held fixed. Uh, and we see that as we decrease the angle, the levels push against each other more and more strongly. And eventually, um, at about 1.1 degrees, well, I passed it. Let's see. Uh, the levels get rather flat. Um, and then if we continue past that point, 
you see they broaden again. And just this fact alone should already give you a hint that there is something uh, non-trivial about these bands, that they are not really um, flat because we took some well-localized states and separated them out to be very far away because uh, we know that the peaks in the local density of states um, are uh, associated with uh, um, are associated with the AA regions, and as we decrease the angle, these peaks move further and further apart. Um, so if the tunneling uh, was decreasing as we uh, decrease uh, uh, the angle and uh, increase the separation uh, between the uh, AA regions, then these bands should have continuously uh, uh, go down in its bandwidth, but that's not what we saw. We saw there was a kind of a magic uh, value, was a special value at 1.1, where uh, the uh, angle got very small. Now let's see, there's uh, a lot of things in the chat. Okay. All right. Um, so um, so if there are any questions at all, for, would be so kind and maybe just uh, uh, interrupt and, uh, 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 and ask me. I won't be following the chat if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'm following. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so that's already a first hint that these bands um, uh, are not really uh, simply in the atomic limit. If, if they were in simply in the atomic limit, then as the uh, uh, peaks in the density of states continued to uh, separate out, uh, the bands would have to continue getting flat. Uh, that's not what we see. We see that there is a, a minimum in the bandwidth at a special value of the angle. And even when the angle decreases um, uh, past that minimum, uh, the bands sort of broaden again. All right, uh, I guess there's no need to introduce this. Uh, Pablo uh, has already discussed uh, many of these um, amazing phenomena that are seen within these narrow bands as we, uh, um, uh, as we add carriers, uh, starting from uh, uh, empty uh, narrow bands, that's this uh, uh, minus four, uh, and then continuously filling it up with up to eight electrons per uh, unit cell. Um, uh, with the amazing correlated phases that appear uh, uh, at integral fillings um, and the superconductivity uh, near uh, the integral fillings at uh, minus, near minus two and, and plus two. Um, so the, the motivation is to try to understand uh, what's going on uh, due to these correlations. Um, uh, Pablo's experiments uh, were uh, quickly uh, reproduced and extended by uh, Andrea Young and Corey Dean's group, where um, they took uh, a twisted bilayer uh, device, which was away from the magic angle. So at 1.27, remember the magic angle under ambient pressure would be 1.1. And um, the, the trace for the conductance um, at the 1.27 uh, is shown by this uh, gray curve here. Um, Okay, there's a dip at the neutrality uh, point, but other than that, uh, there isn't a well-developed correlated state at minus two, uh, at minus two or at, at two. Um, and so you see, we are not at the magic angle uh, condition under ambient pressure. Uh, but then uh, remarkably, when, you, when they apply uh, uh, pressure, so in this particular case, we should be thinking about this as the energy um, associated with the level crossing is fixed because the angle is fixed. As they apply external pressure, they are increasing the interlayer tunneling. Um, and so now uh, uh, the level of repulsion gets stronger um, and they uh, flatten out uh, the band. Um, and remarkably, um, upon um, an optimal value of the pressure, uh, indeed, the correlated states at minus two and two, and in fact, uh, signatures uh, at one uh, and at three uh, appear. Um, uh, these experiments were then um, uh, also remarkably extended by uh, Dmitry Efetov's group, where they saw uh, correlated states uh, at almost every uh, integer uh, and superconductivity almost everywhere in between. So um, now, in order for us to uh, build a theory for the correlations in the narrow bands, uh, we're going to try to uh, uh, integrate out in the renormalization group sense uh, the remote bands um, and uh, systematically uh, study what happens within the uh, narrow bands. Um, 
I will describe a procedure for this, but before I do that, I'd like to uh, make the following uh, a comment, which will be useful to keep in mind uh, as partly a, a motivation for uh, doing this uh, RG uh, treatment. So first, as Pablo has already mentioned, there is an extreme sensitivity of these correlated states uh, in the twisted bilayer uh, graphene to the twist angle. So for example, the data that he showed, uh, shown on the right here, shows that superconducting optimal transition temperature uh, as a function of the twist angle um, uh, shows uh, uh, that even if you deviate uh, from the magic uh, value by 10%, the TC drops, uh, the optimal TC drops precipitously. Um, similar uh, result was uh, presented by Andrea Young's group. Uh, so this is the superconducting uh, dome as a function of the uh, angle. You see an extreme sensitivity to the twist angle. Um, and also uh, this uh, middle plot shows the activation gap at nu equal to minus two uh, correlated insulator state uh, as a function of the twist angle. And again, you see that there is a extreme sensitivity to that, uh, uh, to that angle. So the activation gap drops uh, very quickly as you move away from the magic angle. Now, um, so this made us revisit the question of the Fermi velocity renormalization. Um, so why is this? Well, um, as I mentioned, the important ratio that sets whether the band is narrow uh, is the interlayer uh, uh, level of repulsion in the numerator um, to the energy associated with this level crossing, which in addition to the angle dependence also has Fermi velocity dependence. Now Fermi velocity is usually assumed to be a constant uh, in graphene, but in fact, as has been uh, uh, known theoretically a long time ago in this beautiful work by uh, Gonzalez, Paco Guinea, and Maria Mediano, um, the Coulomb interactions reshape the dispersion of the Dirac cone. Uh, and they make the dispersion in the vicinity of the uh, uh, charge neutrality point steeper. This, uh, so, so as this, um, uh, as this cartoon on the right shows, uh, upon inclusion of the uh, Coulomb interactions, the Dirac cone would go from uh, the, uh, uh, the unrenormalized cone to the cone which has uh, this uh, enhancement of the Fermi velocity uh, shown inside here um, as we approach the Dirac point. Now, uh, this effect has been observed uh, by Gaiman of Osseval on suspended monolayer graphene samples where they remarkably saw uh, almost a factor of two uh, or about a factor of two enhancement of Fermi velocity. Now, uh, if this happened, there would be a huge change in the uh, magic angle condition, simply because the VF in the denominator would uh, be off by this uh, large factor. Um, in addition, uh, they observed an enhancement of the Fermi velocity due to Coulomb interactions in uh, monolayer graphene samples deposited on the hexagonal boronitride, where they saw about 20% enhancement of the uh, Fermi velocity. Again, um, this extreme sensitivity of the correlated phenomena um, would then uh, be able to detect uh, this uh, change, this 20% change uh, of the Fermi velocity. Uh, more recent data by Andrea Young's group uh, has also seen uh, this enhancement of Fermi velocity uh, on hexagonal boronitride encapsulated uh, samples. Um, the reason for the different um, uh, magnitude of this uh, increase uh, is that in the suspended samples, uh, the, there is no dielectric screening, um, uh, while in the deposited samples on hexagonal boron nitride or encapsulated, uh, we also have to deal with the uh, dielectric constant of the hexagonal boron nitride, and then and that decreases the Coulomb interaction um, by about a factor of five. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, this extreme sensitivity of the correlated states to the angle uh, makes us think, uh, uh, go back and to try to understand why don't we see um, 
the uh, shifts in this uh, uh, magic angle condition for devices which would be in different dielectric environments. So for example, um, systems which would be deposited on uh, hexagonal boronitride, so they only have, uh, so that they're exposed to the air from one side, would have a different dielectric environment than the samples which are in capsule. Um, and so I, I will, so in the first uh, part of the lecture, I will show you that this RG uh, uh, treatment that we developed uh, is able to explain this uh, insensitivity uh, to the dielectric environment um, of the magic angle. So to proceed, we're going to use the Bishop's and McDonald model that has been mentioned by uh, Andre and uh, uh, Pablo in the previous uh, talks. Uh, this is a, uh, a continuum model, um, which has already dispensed with the information about the microscopic underlying carbon, uh, carbon lattice. And the only um, excitations which are uh, kept are the excitations in the vicinity of the Dirac cone. And uh, this is partly the answer to the question that was asked before and Pablo answered, uh, namely, uh, what about commensurate versus incommensurate angles um, at this level uh, of the long wavelength uh, continuum uh, theory, there is no uh, difference between commensurate and incommensurate angles. So, um, so this, so this um, uh, uh, business of McDonald Hamiltonian uh, is written uh, here for uh, one valley. Um, the other valley is related by time reversal symmetry. And it's a four by four uh, uh, differential operator. Um, so the upper two by two block uh, acts in the uh, sublattice space. So this Pauli matrix sigma acts in the A or B uh, sublattice. Um, and then this uh, tunneling uh, matrix function um, describes the tunneling through the AA regions uh, parametrized by W0. Um, and then the tunneling through the AB regions parametrized by uh, W1, okay? Um, and there's a nice way to uh, think about this. Oh yeah, so I should also say that um, this uh, subscript theta on the Pauli matrix here simply means that you take, um, a two component vector, so sigma x and sigma y, and then you rotate it about the z axis by the small twist angle uh, uh, theta. Now, the information about the twist angle uh, resides in the interlayer tunneling. So these um, momenta q, j, uh, they know about the twist angle and they know about the new periodicity of the system. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, there's also the information about the twist angle in this Pauli matrix. Now, it turns out that this um, small uh, angle change of the Pauli matrix um, is, uh, is basically negligible uh, effect uh, at, the, at the narrow band. It's, it's, a, it's a small perturbation to the problem where you ignore the small angle uh, difference. There's actually a good theoretical reason uh, uh, beyond this, to, to ignore this is actually a higher order uh, term. In any case, what was noticed by uh, Andre Brnovich's group and by uh, Leon Balance's group uh, is that if you ignore this small uh, twist angle um, uh, rotation of this Pauli matrix, then this non-interacting uh, business of McDonald Hamiltonian enjoys a perfect particle hole uh, symmetry. And this will be uh, useful for us as we uh, go along. I will explain exactly in detail what this particle hole symmetry uh, is. So this is what we have at our uh, disposal um, as our effective low energy uh, theory. And by the way, uh, it's, it is this type of Hamiltonian that has been diagonalized. Um, and I showed you this uh, uh, band structure as a function of the twist angle um, uh, in my uh, earlier slides uh, where we saw the band flattening. All right, so there's a nice way to think about this problem. Um, that was introduced by uh, Leon Balance, namely to think about this as an effective field theory um, in which uh, this is a leading order gradient expansion uh, uh, of, uh, um, of the continuum field theory. And so, so now let's try to think about, let's try to add electron correlations to this problem. Um, we're not gonna focus only on the narrow bands. We're just gonna try to treat the problem uh, with all the remote bands of this business of McDonald Hamiltonian. So the kinetic energy, 
uh, is going to be described by this four by four uh, uh, Hamiltonian uh, matrix uh, for the uh, for um, for the valley K, and then another four by four, which is related to it by spinless time reversal symmetry uh, for the valley K prime. And these chi fields here, uh, sigma corresponds to spin up and down. Um, and the psi here are the exact wave functions of the business McDonald Hamiltonian, which um, live at the crystal momentum K, their band is N. Um, and then um, uh, and the top component lives in the valley K. Okay, the bottom component then lives in the valley K prime, which is related by time error symmetry. Um, so now the Coulomb interactions uh, at this uh, uh, point, we can write down um, uh, as following. This delta rho is a, a fluctuation density operator. So it's a, so it's a, it's a density um, uh, minus the background density. At this point, this uh, anti-commutator is simply a constant. Um, and we are free to subtract a constant uh, from uh, this uh, density fluctuation uh, operator as long as we adjust the chemical potential uh, properly. And the particle hole symmetry actually allows us to fix the chemical potential of this problem. So um, the, um, at, the, uh, at the bare UV scale, our Coulomb interactions can be written uh, in this form, okay? Uh, it will be useful for us to think about this uh, term that we are subtracting because we will renormalize this term um, uh, through the spectral decomposition. Uh, it's uh, it, due to particle hole symmetry, it can be written as this uh, sum over uh, all the states um, uh, below the upper energy cutoff uh, EC down to the neutrality point. So, so that's the term that is being subtracted. Okay, um, so now um, we know that in a monolayer graphene, um, even if the sample was suspended, the Coulomb interactions do not appear to be strong enough to gap out the charge neutrality point. In other words, whatever putative quantum phase transition there would be with strong Coulomb repulsion, we are sitting on the semi-metallic side of that phase transition. Um, now, in the case which uh, we're considering here, we also have the screening Due to the hexagonal boronitride. So the Coulomb interactions are suppressed relative to the uh, Coulomb interactions in the suspended samples. Um, and so uh, we are actually deeper in the monolayer graph on the uh, semi metallic side of any putative quantum phase transition that would happen with stronger uh, uh, Coulomb repulsion. So we know, therefore, that we can treat the effects of the Coulomb interaction in monolayer graphene uh, perturbatively. And this was, of course, done in this uh, pioneering paper by uh, Gonzalez, uh, Guinea, and Cosmediano. And what they found out, as I mentioned, is the steepening of the uh, Fermi velocity. Now, the problem that we are facing uh, now is, is a little bit more complicated because in addition to, of course, the Dirac dispersion, we also have the interlayer tunnel. However, we can split the energy into three different regimes. There is a regime um, between our UV cutoff, which is set by the Fermi velocity divided by the carbon-carbon distance. So this is of the order of EV, maybe two EV, uh, down to an energy scale, which is of the order of the interlayer tunneling, which um, is marked here by EC star. And in this regime, um, the Coulomb interaction is perturbative. Uh, and so is uh, the interlayer tunnel, because we're at high energies compared to the interlayer tunnel. Now, and there, are, if you were to try to solve this problem numerically, there would be thousands of bands here. Um, so trying to eliminate these bands numerically um, is uh, probably impossible because there's simply too many of them. But we'll find out that we can treat this analytically in a very nice way. Then there is another intermediate regime below this energy scale EC star. This energy scale is not sharply defined. It is only of the order of W1. And we should think about this as an energy scale at which 
a, a perturbative treatment of the interlayer tunneling in stage one um, starts breaking down. Okay, so below EC star, but before we reach the narrow bands, the interlayer tunneling is no longer perturbative, it's non perturbative. So we have to keep it exactly in the Green's functions, but we still have a gap to the remote bands. Um, and so Coulomb interaction uh, would then be perturbative uh, in stage two. Okay. Um, and then finally, we will have integrated out all the remote bands and we are left with just the narrow bands, which we have magnified in this picture by 10. And now within this last stage, uh, the Coulomb interaction is stronger than the bandwidth. And here, both the Coulomb interaction and the interlayer tunneling uh, are non-perturbative. So it is in this last step that we will switch to strong coupling uh, approach. So that's the strategy. So in stage one, we take our fields, electron fields, we split them into fast and slow. Uh, by fast, we mean all the modes whose exact business of McDonald energy sits between the cutoff EC and some sliding cutoff EC prime, okay? Such that the EC prime is still much, much larger than W0 or W1, so that we have not entered into a regime where the interlayer tunneling becomes non perturbative. Um, now, uh, the Coulomb interaction will then uh, contain fast and slow modes. We're going to integrate out the fast modes. And uh, at leading order, we will be left with the renormalization of the self energy. And uh, this renormalization due to the uh, Coulomb interaction of the self energy contain um, this function delta f, which um, can be written in terms of the exact uh, eigenfunctions of the BM model. Um, uh, uh, this way, it's a sum over all block states uh, in this energy window EC and EC prime. Um, it's a sign sum because uh, some of them are occupied, some of them are unoccupied. Um, and, uh, and in addition to that, what happens is that if you integrate out the fast modes, this background term, which is being subtracted, um, now also uh, has this uh, new cutoff scale EC prime uh, in it, okay? Um, and so our goal is then to figure out by how much is this term changing the business of McDonald Hamiltonian. And this looks complicated because we, it looks like we need the exact wave functions of the business of McDonald model. But as I mentioned, um, we have an advantage that in the stage one, um, the problem is perturbative in the interlayer tunneling. So we're going to take the sum over all the uh, uh, exact eigenstates between EC, the UV cutoff, and the sliding cutoff EC prime. And we're going to rewrite it um, through a, a Cauchy integral of uh, a, a Green's function. Um, uh, remember, in the spectral decomposition of the Green's function, the wave functions sit in the numerator. And then Z minus the energy of those wave functions sit in the denominator. The first one is evaluated at R, the second one is at R prime. So that's this R and R prime. And then the Cauchy contour, contour that we choose is in a counterclockwise sense encircling EC prime and EC on the right. And then in the clockwise sense, uh, encircling uh, minus EC prime and EC uh, on the left. And that's going to give us this sign that we need over here. And so once we have it written in terms of the uh, Green's function, then we can just do a standard perturbative uh, uh, expansion of this Green's function. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the perturbative expansion is in the interlayer tunnel. So the zeroth order diagram, when we ignore the interlayer, interlayer tunneling, is just the, the one that was considered a um, long time ago. Um, uh, and it gives us this self energy. And is this self energy that was responsible for the uh, uh, logarithmic increase of the uh, Coulomb interaction? Um, now we have a second uh, a diagram, which I will also which I will show you is also logarithmic, um, in which uh, we scatter by one of these Moray wave vectors uh, Q. So this is what this dashed line with X is supposed to represent. All right, so let's just go, since this is a school, we should uh, uh, explain the calculations. Um, 
so let's go through the, uh, the, the first term, the self-energy. Uh, we have our contour integral uh, uh, written over here, over Z, and then we just simply have um, the Coulomb interaction and the bare um, Green's function uh, unperturbed by the interlayer tunneling. Okay, we write this Green's function in the spectral decomposition um, so that the uh, Cauchy integrals are easy to uh, perform. And uh, uh, this is, of course, just a projector onto the helicities um, that can. Uh, that can easily be done. Um, and what we discover is that we have this integral. Uh, now, because um, we are interested in the behavior of the self energy at uh, low uh, energy, so low K this is our external momentum, we can expand this. Is a question? Uh, yeah, it's actually me that has the question. <laughs> I, okay, have, yeah. I have the question. Uh, <laughs> so here you're taking the interaction to be the same as that uh, 90s paper, like this one over uh, absolute value of K. So it's the end screen. Uh, That's right. That's right. Right now That's you see, so so the only place where the screening would come in is through the dielectric environment. So this epsilon would be about four and a half um, for the uh, hexagonal boron nitride. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so that means that your calculation is strictly speaking for the moment at the uh, at charge neutrality. Or... Not necessarily, not necessarily. So, so right now we're just integrating out modes uh, from high energy, but then eventually how many particles we consider within the narrow band, uh, you see, we are still far away from the narrow band. Mm. And once we are left with a theory that contains only the modes within the narrow band, we can study that theory at different fillings. This is not necessarily just at the charge neutrality. No. Uh, I guess I'm confused that by the fact that the Coulomb interaction is long range. Uh... Yeah, so, so, so the only thing that would screen the Coulomb interaction at this point, the only thing that would screen the long range part of the Coulomb interaction at this point are the gates. So mm. if the, there is nothing uh, in the hexagonal right, boron nitride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, I understand now. You're, you're just like, yeah, okay. You're, you're just going down in energy and then right. that will screen eventually. Okay. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. All right. Um, now, um, okay. So, so at this point, the external momentum case uh, is, is small compared to uh, Q, which has to sit in this window. And so we can just expand um, the uh, Coulomb part this way. Now, you see, naively, we get one over Q piece here. Um, and that would make this, um, uh, however, that term makes, uh, uh, makes the integral vanish by the angle integration. So in fact, it is the next order term that gives rise to the logarithm. Uh, uh, and then uh, once we uh, so once we do this expansion, uh, uh, we see that we have a Q mu Q nu here. The uh, angle integration uh, tells us that uh, Q mu Q nu is going to have to be um, a half of delta mu nu Q squared. So then the integra angle integration is easy to perform, um, and then we are just simply left with rather trivial uh, 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 integration over the magnitude of Q. Um, that gives us um, the renormalization of the uh, sigma dot p term in the Coulomb, in the uh, Dirac particle. There's a log which knows about the ratio of these two scales, and then there's a coefficient which knows about the Coulomb interaction, um, uh, including this famous factor of a quarter. All right, so that's uh, that's that simple. Um, now, uh, so we see uh, if we carefully uh, compare with our bare term that uh, this, this, this corresponds to an enhancement of, um, the, um, of the Fermi velocity uh, as we approach the Dirac point uh, due to the Coulomb interaction with the remote phase. Um, okay, in the stage one. So now uh, let's consider the, the second term. This is a new term, it, has not, it was not considered before. Um, it's perturbatively expanded in the Ws and so this, uh, Tj here corresponds to the visita McDonald uh, T um, uh, interlayer tunneling that scatters uh, from Q to uh, Q plus G1. Um, and now we just have to perform this integral. Um, again, we are going to make a spectral decomposition of these uh, uh, Green's functions. Uh, sorry, sorry, this should be G0. 
Um, and now we see that we have in this contour integral, uh, we have um, four possibilities. Um, either the two poles um, are, um, uh, so either we choose the same sign in the denominator or we choose the opposite sign in the denominator. If we choose the same sign in the denominator, um, then either the two, both of these uh, uh, energies are uh, inside or both of them are outside uh, of the contour. Um, or one of them is inside, the other is outside, but only by a little bit. So it turns out that if both of them are inside and both of them are outside, the integral identically vanishes, the contour integral. If one of them is in and the other is out, maybe there's a contribution. But it turns out that, that contribution gets canceled by the next shell of the RG. And you can easily convince yourself that that's the case simply by enlarging um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the window over which you're tracing out the poles. So in fact, the only contribution uh, that is logarithmically large and really contributes to the uh, flow, the RG flow, is when one of these poles uh, is inside of the contour with the minus sign, so let's say, and the other one is outside with the plus sign, okay? For which there are two contributions. Um, uh, okay, so it's just a simple contour integral. You know how to evaluate this. Uh, we get this expression. Uh, it looks uh, a bit complicated, but in fact, Remember, we are at this point trying to perform a gradient expansion in the spirit of uh, the effective field theory. Um, and so uh, we can uh, expand in small k. Okay? And the leading order term that we would get is just simply setting k to zero uh, and setting these g's to zero in the denominator. Okay? Everything else will not contribute uh, a logarithmic. Uh, uh, anything, anything is logarithmic. And you can see that this is logarithmic simply by power counting. You get one power of Q in a denominator here. You get another power of Q in a denominator in D, and you get two powers of Q in the measure. So at K equal to zero and at G uh, equal to uh, zero, uh, this is where the key logarithm is. Everything else is sub log. I see there's another question. Um, can you repeat what is the physical meaning of the sign of the denominator in the Green's function, please? Um, the physical meaning of the sign uh, in a denominator is the following. If you take um, a Green's function for um, uh, just a Dirac, uh, unperturbed Dirac particle, right? So you know that it propagates both helicities, okay? So the, the, the physical meaning of the numerator is a projector onto a helicity, uh, okay? So if you project onto, let's say, positive helicity, that's the minus sign in the numerator, okay? Then uh, that corresponds, uh, sorry, when you project onto positive helicity, that's the plus sign in the numerator, um, that corresponds to having a pole at positive energy uh, via uh, Q and vice versa for the other one. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay, so coming back to, uh, calculation of this renormalization, um, well, um, we see that, uh, that, that this is the term that is logarithmic. Um, and now we have this interesting situation where we are sandwiching the, this is a McDonald tunneling matrix uh, between these two projectors. So um, the projectors have to have opposite helicity. So, uh, so it's either the plus sign in the top and the minus plus sign on the left, uh, and a minus sign on the right, or it's a minus sign on the left, and we have to add that um, to the plus sign on the right. Now, the interlayer tunneling, okay, is itself a matrix. Um, and let's see. Uh, so that matrix contains an identity. Uh, that's the one that's proportional to W0. And then uh, it contains a piece which is proportional to uh, sigma X and sigma Y. Remember, sigmas. Uh, act in the sublattice uh, space. Um, and that's, that piece contains, uh, that, that's proportional to W1, the interlayer tunneling through the AB region. Now imagine that you substitute just this first piece that's proportional to identity here. So you can immediately see that in that case, the numerator vanishes because you have a projector onto positive helicity, identity and projector onto negative helicity, and the product of the projectors is zero. So we see there will be no log renormalization of the interlayer tunneling through the AA region. On the other hand, if we have a sigma X or sigma Y over here, then that can actually flip 
uh, the uh, helicity, or it can it can make a superposition of the helicity. So that one will survive. And the simplest way to see that is now imagine performing the angle integral. Okay, you open up this bracket. There are three terms. So there's an identity t identity. Then there's going to be a piece which contains one power of q hat that vanishes by angle integration, and then there's a piece which contains two powers of q hat. Uh, that's simply uh, one half delta mu nu, just as before. Uh, and so it's going to uh, get us uh, sigma mu, sigma nu. That's the delta mu nu. It, it gives us a trace. And then we have to put a sigma x or sigma y in between. And no matter which one you put in there, because uh, mu runs over uh, x and y, this will also vanish. So the so everything except for the identity term in the projector for the sigma x and sigma y term in the interlayer tunneling uh, will vanish. The only one which will survive is the identity sigma x, sigma y identity. Okay. Um, and so if you do that, you find another logarithm. And that's a log renormalization of the W1. Okay. So uh, now, so we see that W1 also increases at low moment at low momenta due to the Coulomb interaction. And so now we can write uh, our flow equations. The the first one is just the uh, famous flow equation from uh, uh, from Gonzalez, uh, Maria Gosmediano, and uh, Paco Pinea uh, to one loop. Uh, the second one tells us that the interlayer tunneling through the AA region does not renormalize. Oops, sorry. Uh, and the last one uh, uh, is just the renormalization of the uh, interlayer tunneling through the AB region. Now, notice that in this RG scheme, I am not rescaling the momentum back to its uh, original uh, UV cutoff value, which is usually done in textbooks uh, on Wilsonian RG. There's no, uh, you don't have to do this. You can just continue, continuously uh, decrease um, uh, the number of degrees of freedom that you have in the system and decrease the cutoff. It would be actually useful to do that in our case uh, as we switch to stage two. So uh, this is the reason why you don't actually see the engineering dimensions. Uh, of these couplings. Um, if I were to rescale the cutoff back and rescale the fields, you would also see the engineering dimension. But um, uh, here you don't see that. In any case, you can see that there's a difference between the AA tunneling and the AB tunneling uh, flow due to Coulomb interaction. So now, these equations are not hard to solve. In the first equation, the right-hand side is a constant, so we can easily integrate it. And once we have the scale dependence of the Fermi velocity, we can just simply substitute it in here into the last equation. Uh, it's a separable equation, so we can move w1 to the left-hand side and do the integral on both sides um, and, uh, uh, and, and easily solve it. Um, so then what we, fi then what we find uh, is the following. The ratio of uh, w1 to uh, delta k, which I'm not writing here, times df, uh, is actually an RG invariant. In other words, um, the interlayer tunneling through the AB region renormalizes just as fast as the VF increases to keep this ratio fixed. On the other hand, because W0 does not renormalize due to Coulomb interaction in this order, the ratio of W0 to W1 actually decreases um, as we approach low energy. And it uh, decreases through this logarithm. So if we could set the upper cutoff to infinity, OK, it's not infinite because uh, there is a, there's a natural UV cutoff to this uh, Dirac dispersion. But if we, if we did this as a field theory, then this log would diverge. And this would tell us that before we even reach the stage 2 RG, um, the ratio between the A, A tunneling and the AB tunneling shrinks to 0. And that's interesting because uh, that's the so-called chiral limit uh, defined by Ternopolsky, uh, Kruchkov, and uh, Vishwanath, um, in which they uh, studied the business and McDonald model at the non-interacting level simply by setting W0 uh, to 0. So we see we are flowing towards this chiral limit. Now, the cutoff is itself not infinite. It's, um, uh, uh, it's maybe 2 EV. Um, and then the... Um, the scale at which we have to stop stage one, RG, 
it's offset by a few W1. So that's going to be, let's say, about 200 MeV. So maybe we can get, uh, uh, maybe we can get a factor of 10, um, maybe a little bit more inside of this logarithm. But uh, it's not going to be uh, infinite. Okay. Um, in addition, we have this uh, uh, annoying factor of four that decreases uh, the, the magnitude here and the dielectric constant, which itself is about four. So, so this is indeed a suppression of W0 over W1 in the realistic samples, but it is not going to bring us all the way to the chiral limit. We are approaching this chiral limit. If one could engineer devices where this dielectric constant was, uh, was closer to one, the effect would be stronger. Um, just as the VF enhancement um, in the uh, monolayer graphene uh, observed by Gamma and Losolov was stronger uh, when the samples were suspended. Um, in any case, the, the first result uh, explains uh, what I mentioned originally, namely that the value of the magic angle is largely insensitive to the Coulomb interaction because the strong dependence of the band flatness is actually on the ratio of W1 uh, and H bar and uh, delta KVF. Uh, there's a much, much weaker dependence uh, on this ratio. All right, now, um, so how about stage two? So in stage two, we need to uh, switch um, uh, and treat the interlayer tunneling non-perturbatively while we still treat the uh, Coulomb interaction perturbatively. So the way we do that is um, we sim simply take, uh, so we go to band bases, okay? Um, we have, um, certain number of bands above and certain number of bands below, anywhere between 20 and 70 bands above and below. And then uh, we simply integrate out the highest uh, energy uh, band and the lowest energy band away from uh, the charge uh, neutrality point. So charge neutrality point is not touched, right? So we are approaching uh, from above. Um, and as we do that, we compute this delta F, RR prime. That gives us a renormalization of the Bishop's and McDonald's Hamiltonian, now written in a band basis. Um, we rotate the basis such that we diagonalize that term. That rotates our Coulomb interaction. Uh, and uh, we continue this until we are left uh, with just the narrow bands, which we don't touch at this point. So the example of how this could run, um, uh, here I just chose to illustrate this on a chiral limit. So uh, W0 is set to 0 already. Uh, you don't have to do that. Um, shown here, there'll be a little movie uh, where we start with, um, um, I think it's 30 bands above or 30, maybe 40 above and 40 below. Um, and at first we have all the bands and hopefully you can see this movie running. Uh, we are removing the bands um, uh, one by one uh, and renormalize the dispersion. As you see, the, uh, the remote bands are indeed going up in energy. Um, yeah, so they're 40 above and 40 below. And eventually, we are left just with the uh, narrow bands. Okay, and uh, at this point, we can no longer treat the problem perturbatively. Uh, the bandwidth is small um, compared to the Coulomb interaction, and we're going to switch to strong coupling. Okay, but we know which uh, problem uh, we should be studying uh, in strong coupling. In particular, this background subtra subtraction is uh, is clearly um, uh, clearly isolated. Uh, in this particular case. Now, um, as I mentioned, this uh, scale EC star at which we stop the stage one and start stage two um, is, uh, is arbitrary. Um, it's defined only up to um, uh, making sure that stage one is under control. Okay, so nobody tells me that I should choose this to be uh, 3W1 versus 10W1. I could have chosen, uh, as long as stage one is under control, um, I'm free to choose this uh, scale EC star um, uh, differently. And of course, the physical result cannot depend on where I stop stage one and start stage two. Um, and so what we do is we demonstrate this uh, in these two plots. So NC in this plot is the number of bands above and below which are kept in stage two. Okay, so um, on the left, you see the band structures obtained 
after uh, RG um, uh, procedure uh, in stage two. We haven't finished the stage two procedure yet. We still have some bands left, but we chose a different number. So we have chosen a different UV cutoff for stage two. And as you can clearly see, um, the results that you get depend on the upper cutoff. Okay? Um, that's because we have not renormalized the F and Ws based on the result of stage one. But if we do that, if we scale um, the, uh, uh, the problem on the left with the result obtained from stage one, you see a perfect collapse of these benefits. So this demonstrates that um, the flows from stage one, which are analytical, and the numerically determined flow from stage two um, seamlessly uh, cross into each other, um, and the result does not depend on where we stop. Is there a question? Yeah, there's a question by uh, Miguel Garcia. Um, can one relate the decreasing ratio of I guess it's W0, W1, uh, with the fact that flat band states are localized at AA regions. Uh, I'm not sure how, whether that's, um, whether that relationship exists. And I, I don't see why. I mean, at high energies, you sort of don't really know much about the flat bands. Um, it, it really just simply comes from the effect I showed you. I don't know how to explain it any better than, um, you know, you have this uh, two opposite helicity um, uh, uh, propagators uh, sandwiching uh, the interlayer tunneling. Um, and uh, as you saw, uh, there's no effect on, uh, on uh, uh, the interlayer tunneling through the A region. But I don't think it has anything to do um, with um, the density of these being the local density of states being peaked at the AA. Is there another question? Uh, and there's a second question, yeah. Um, Mert, uh, how would the RG equations change if you include next loop orders uh, in the first stage? Do they leave the qualitative picture invariant? Right, so they have to because uh, it's perturbative under control. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, okay. So, so this demonstrates that we can stop the analytical RG and continue with the numerical RG um, with uh, exact uh, wave functions um, uh, seamlessly. And um, uh, okay. And uh, the other point I'd like to make is that at this point, instead of having thousands of bands that we need to renormalize, we only have about 20, if you want to push it, 72, it doesn't really matter as you see here. Um, and that's numerically uh, perfectly feasible. It's not a problem. All right. So um, now what happens uh, under stage two? So at this point, we can only probe this numerically. So one of the things we can check is the so-called sublattice polarization. Um, so we, we know that in the chiral limit, um, the wave functions of the narrow band can be chosen to be perfectly sublattice polarized. In other words, while they can live on both layers, the wave functions would live entirely on the A sublattice in one um, band and uh, in the other sublattice B um, for the other band. So, uh, however, if we go away from the um, chiral limit, just in the business McDonald model, then we find um, at while there is some sublattice uh, polarization, it's not perfect, okay? Uh, it, it's actually rather small. So the picture on the left shows you the bare sublattice polarization for the narrow band. And then um, once we are done with stage two, we see uh, the sublattice polarization uh, numerically determined, and we see that it's much stronger, okay? So this also suggests that even during the stage two, which is only numerical, we are indeed going towards the chiral limit. Now, um, this is, I don't know how much time I have left, but this is the last part I'd like to uh, discuss uh, uh, because I think it will nicely uh, um, connect with uh, hopefully what's, what uh, Titus is going to talk about, um, namely um, uh, hybrid Vanier uh, basis. So, um, and, and this will come in as a way to check 
what's happening during the stage two of RRG. So as was uh, discussed in this very nice paper, um, um, we can imagine we take the position operator, it's really a periodic version of a position operator with this delta Q um, uh, sketched here uh, being a small uh, difference between the two Q points in the Brillouin zone along this direction. Um, for example, uh, we take this operator, we project it onto the narrow bands, and then we diagonalize this operator, okay? So uh, now uh, clearly uh, the momentum along uh, G2 is a good quantum number. So the eigenstates and the eigenvalues of this operator will be eigenstates, uh, can be labeled by uh, this uh, K. Um, okay, so there's a procedure for how to do this. I'm not gonna go through it in detail. Um, I just I just like to point out that the um, the eigenvalues are related to the expectation value of the uh, position uh, operator along this direction delta Q um, in the units of the Moray uh, uh, period Ln. Okay, so um, so these are the famous uh, Wilson loops which were uh, asked about and, and, and touched upon uh, previously. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with them, we can think of them uh, uh, as sort of uh, an expectation value of the center of uh, the chart. And, and now we can study what happens to that uh, expectation value as a function of the good quantum number K. So in particular, as we change this K, uh, does the expectation value move to the left or to the right? Does it drift across the Brillouin zone? Um, the way the Landau tube uh, wave functions would uh, in the Landau gauge uh, um, uh, Landau levels. Okay, now, but before I do that, let me just show you what the wave functions actually look like. So uh, they're indeed extended in one direction and localized in the other direction, but they're not really just simple Gaussians. Okay, they're not really like the lowest Landau level wave functions. So even though the centers may be drifting left and right, the distributions they are um, highly structured. Um, so these four plots on the left uh, take one of these hybrid binary state wave functions um, uh, in the central unit cells, that's the zero, the first zero. And the second zero says that the uh, good quantum number wave vector K is set to zero. Uh, and they're decomposed into two different um, layers and two different sublattices. So this is a top layer sublattice A, top layer sublattice B, bottom layer sublattice is A, bottom layer sublattice is B. Um, you see the peaks are still sitting on these AA positions, which are marked by these uh, uh, black dots. So, that, so, so the peaks in the wave function form this triangular lattice centered on uh, AA, okay? Now, as we change the momentum, so now we go from zero to 0.5, you see that the distribution is still peaked on the A sub lattice, but the expectation value of a position, which would be somewhere in the middle uh, here in this left picture, uh, moves to the left here. So, so when we say that the Wilson loop winds, uh, we are really only just saying something about the, um, the mean of the distribution, uh, but the distributions them themselves are rather complicated okay, and structured. Okay, so here are the Wilson loops just simply for the unrenormalized non-interacting this is a mcdonald model as we change this dimensionless parameter of the a a to a b tandem so the picture on the top left is the chiral limit um and we see that the two bands per valley per spin uh, indeed uh, have a topology to them they wind as andre advertised so we can think of them as one of them having a churn one forming a churn one and one of them forming a churn minus one Okay, and this is true regardless of the ratio of W0 to W1. Um, as we start increasing this ratio, uh, we still see this wind. But uh, you see the shape of the Wilson loop is actually changing uh, as you move away from the chiral limit. The topology doesn't, but the geometry does. Now, so now what we can do is we can take the bare value of uh, our interactions. Um, uh, that's the blue uh, to be what's considered to be the realistic value, so 0.83. It should really be measured in UV for us to be sure. 
And the Wilson loop for that, okay, it winds, but you see uh, it's this blue uh, curve. Um, and then we can study it under RG, okay? So after stage one, which is analytical, not surprisingly, the Wilson loop steepens. Uh, and this is this red curve. It's not surprising because we are moving towards the chiral limit. But now in stage two, which is all done numerically and within the band basis, uh, we also see that the Wilson loop continues steepening. Okay, so uh, indeed, uh, uh, at the end of stage two, uh, we have um, we have renormalized Wilson loop, um, which is closer to the chiral limit. And for this particular case, it would take us from about 0.83 to maybe 0.6, maybe a little bit less. Um, now, let me make a comment about um, frozen remote band approximation which is adopted in many papers in literature. This is not done here. Now, um, a lot of people freeze the remote bands, but in this case, the completeness of the single particle Hilbert space guarantees that if you freeze the remote band Hilbert space, you are also freezing the Hilbert space of the narrow bands. Um, and so while the energies of the narrow bands can change due to interaction with the frozen remote bands, um, the narrow band wave functions uh, do not, of course, up to trivial unitary rotation. So that subspace is fixed. Now, the sublattice polarization operator and the Wilson loop eigenvalues are determined by the projection operator onto the narrow band subspace. Because that does not change, the sublattice Wilson loops, um, the sublattice polarization and the Wilson loop are therefore unaffected uh, in this frozen band approximation by the remote bands. But as we saw, uh, the effect, uh, but they are actually affected by the remote bands. And so this effect is um, missed. Uh, in this frozen band approximation. Okay, so um, so this is the end of stage two. And now we are in the final step, um, which is really the interesting part. Um, we have our effective theory for the narrow bands with renormalized uh, wave functions with Coulomb interactions, and we're going to try to solve that part in strong couple. Now, Adolf, can you tell me how much time I have left? Um. Yeah, I think you started around maybe five minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, we were writing okay. quite late then. Okay. So, so, so in this final step, uh, our goal is to um, then treat the Coulomb interaction as the dominant term, and that the bandwidth, the kinetic energy, the renormalized kinetic energy that will come in due to the RG as a perturbation. And we're going to try to check whether that's a sensible thing uh, to do um, at the very end. Now, there are different ways to treat this problem. You can treat this in momentum space. You can treat this in a hybrid Vanier basis, or you can treat this in 2D exponentially localized basis, as we did uh, in this uh, uh, paper in 2019 with Gian. Um, uh, and despite the obstructions, you can actually gain a lot of insight into uh, the physics of the strong couple. In particular, as was shown in this paper, you can see why um, the anti-ferromagnetic super exchange fails. And in fact, why, why this problem is ferromagnetic uh, as opposed to anti-ferromagnetic. Um, now, um, in any case, the problem to be solved now is uh, we are left with Coulomb interactions projected onto the narrow bands. We're gonna treat the renormalized kinetic energy as small and try to see what can one say uh, in this limit? So now, if we are at a charge neutrality point, then any many body state that is annihilated by delta rho is a ground state because the interaction is positive semi Um At even integer filling, uh, it turns out that the ground states uh, of this strong coupling limit um, are also many body eigenstates of this delta rho, okay? Um, and this was shown uh, in, uh, in the full uh, problem numerically by uh, Andre's uh, group. And, uh, and then at odd integer filling, if the sublattice is perfectly polarized, so if we're in a chiral limit, then the churn states are ground states of this Hamilton. Now, so these are not the only ground states, however. Um, it um, turns out 
that this so so the, the big point here is that these generalized ferromagnets are favored by the projective Coulomb interaction. But these are not the only ground states. Um, there are states which um, are related by a global uh, spin valley rotation symmetry uh, to the states I just mentioned. And I guess um, um, uh, I don't think I have enough time in this lecture uh, to discuss this spin valley U4 symmetry in the strong coupling limit. Um, let me just uh, maybe mention that the particle hole symmetry is key for establishing uh, this U4 uh, spin valley symmetry. Um, and maybe I just stop here and then continue with this uh, on the next lecture in the interest of time. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Oscar, for this very clear, uh, clear and very detailed uh, explanation. Um, so actually, there's a there's a, com a question on particle hole symmetry. Uh, how do the high energy degrees of freedom affect the particle hole symmetry for the flat bands? Okay. So. Um, I didn't discuss this, but uh, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, but we can actually do that calculation in real time. So uh, let's see. Let me go back to. So I presume that um, the question is about the terms which are omitted in the HBM. Let's see. Hey, here we go. So, so the term that breaks particle hole symmetry in HBM is due to the rotation in the business model, model is due to the rotation of the Pauli matrix. Yeah. Now, one way to proceed is to uh, remove this uh, uh, rotation by unitary transformation simply by absorbing the phase into the top layer wave function. And then it's going to um, uh, rotate uh, this interlayer tunnel. Now, so uh, the, the the interlayer tunneling is now going to find itself uh, sandwiched um, in uh, uh, in something like e to the i theta uh, uh, sigma z. Now, um, it contains two parts. The interlayer tunneling. There's a part which is sigma x and sigma y, and that anti commutes through sigma z. So that part is unaffected. Now the part that gets affected is the part that is proportional to identity. So that piece will now pick up a cosine of that small angle. And then we'll also pick up an I sine sigma Z of that small angle. So, in, so, so if we now go back to um, our actual calculation uh, here, uh, here, um, then this rotated interlayer tunneling matrix T will contain not just, um, oh, sorry, so it will contain not just identity sigma X and sigma Y, but it also contains I sigma Z with a very small coefficient, sign of that small angle. So now we can just go through this calculation and we did this. So it's in a supplementary of our paper with Gian. And what you will discover is that now, um, uh, because sigma z anti-commutes through both, um, the second term actually does not vanish, but it adds up. So we will get a renormalization of that new term, let's call it w3, which comes from the rotation, due to Coulomb interactions, and it will grow. But when you check how much does it actually grow for realistic parameters, you can get about a factor of two enhancement of that term by the time you reach the narrow band. But it already starts out very small. It starts out sine of, it's down by a sine of uh, uh, one degree. So whether it's sine of one degree or two degrees, it's still small. So while particle hole symmetry um, uh, uh, is certainly broken, um, the leading term in the uh, uh, narrow bands will still be particle hole symmetric. And then this term should now be treated as a perturbation. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, um, I think the next question is by Andre. Uh, you can unmute yourself. 
Oh, yes. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I did this right for once. Um, so uh, I have a question about uh, um, the well, very interesting um, RG. So in effect, I'm thinking that this the Wilson loop is actually telling you that in RG, the gap between the um, flat and uh, passive band is growing. Is that true? Right. I think I think it's true. Uh, you can see that actually in the little movie that I ran for stage two. Right. Uh, yeah, I think it, I, I I think this makes it very clear actually. So it's very nice. Yeah. Here. So you see that band is indeed growing. I mean, the gap is indeed growing. The the remote bands are moving up. Right, and this this flattening and winding, this flattening of the Wilson loop that you get at large W zero over W is basically due to the fact that the most of the Berry curvature is concentrated around, right? The, the gap is yeah. low at the gamma point and most of it is concentrated there. Is that right. that's the picture right. you have? Yep, that's right. Okay. I see. Okay. It's it's do you understand why it's so I guess at 0 0.8, the gap is not the smallest, right? The gap is the smallest at, at the isotropic point, the gap between the uh, passive band and the uh, active bands, right? Then it closes, right? Right, so, so but, I, but it, it seems like it's very flat. It's flatter at- Oh, I see, point some eight. monotonic behavior, roughly. Yeah, I no, I don't understand why it's non-monotonic. I see, okay, thanks. Welcome. Okay, maybe there's a time for one more question, but if not, uh, I mean, I don't see any other question. Um, so thanks, uh, Oscar, very uh, very nice talk. Looking for, forward to your next lecture. And I think we can reconvene 